Okay, so first of all, I want to, to thank you very much for being there. Uh, I want to thank the uh, ACES and I want to thank the uh, young organizers. Uh, it's uh, quite unusual for me. Usually I'm invited by people that I've known for 30 or 40 years, uh, usual suspects in the mathematical community, and it's very refreshing to be invited by young people. You know, one feels younger and I, I really enjoy this occasion. Um, <laughs> briefly. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the hospitality. I'm uh, uh, just sorry that uh, my way to say thanks is to give a mathematical talk for an hour. Um, but that's, you know, we mathematicians are strange beasts uh, that uh, tend to do such things, such uh, very impolite things. You probably have never heard of midfield games. That's normal. Uh, and uh, it's a uh, rather new <coughs> area that uh, I created with my old friend, colleague, and uh, conspirator, Jean-Michel Lassy, who is uh, a part-time mathematician. He is uh, also doing all kinds of things, including when they are running the startup that we uh, founded together, which is in fact on Midfield Games. I, I might mention a few things. I also want, want to acknowledge the support for all these projects of the chair, which is some kind of scientific project, which is called uh, FDD, Finance and Sustainable Development in French. Uh, usually, what doesn't bring together those words, uh, finance is like uh, almost has become like a, you know, a word that is impolite to pronounce, and uh, sustainable development is much more politically correct, but certainly linking together the two things is a very, in fact, very important topic that we are trying to cover in this research project. And uh, many of the situations which are connected to sustainable development and the economy of developing countries or the economy of uh, 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 non-renewable resources involve many players, many agents. So that's how we uh, design, that's why we're forced to design, to try to design models, uh, mathematical models of situations that involve lots of agents. Lots of players. So that's the game part. Minfield is a borrowed from statistical physics. I will come back to that later. Um, <clears throat> although uh, you know we have this uh, noble goal, uh, we have to confess that our first example of, mi of a Minfield game model was to try to make a model of uh, uh, the, the way the cars, uh, you know, are being driven around the Arc de Triomphe, the Place Charles de Gaulle. So it's a, you know, a big place where there are lots of cars, lots of Parisian drivers, you know, borderline crazy, and uh, you know, driving very, very fast. And uh, you can see that when the traffic is quite intense, uh, the traffic is getting organized in circles. Uh, why? Uh, so, uh, and in fact, the first model that we provide, which was a mitigate na nature, was on this uh, circle behavior for cars. Uh, I have many more stupid examples, uh, and I will uh, certainly spend some time on stupid examples, uh, because I think they are quite, uh, you know, that's one way to learn uh, a theory is through stupid examples. Um, so, um, one of those stupid examples is uh, at what time a meeting should start. So, suppose that we are in a civilized country where everyone <laughs> is almost a bit late to a meeting. And uh, the, um, <clears throat> so uh, typically people have uh, random transportation time to get to the meeting. You have absolutely no incentive to be precisely on time at the meeting because it won't start on time. But certainly you have a very strong incentive against being at the meeting after it has started. Okay? And so, can you make a model of that? Uh, you may s s think this example is totally ridiculous and is, uh, except that when you uh, think of oil prices and you realize that most probably uh, when a big proportion of oil has been extracted, uh, let's say 90%, then oil is worthless because everybody will have to switch to different energies by that time. So this is exactly, you can see now the, uh, the, the analogy. Uh, so one example is about the meeting time, and I will conclude this uh, this lecture, uh, so you can at least uh, you know 
we can go back to things which are a little more uh, practical uh, about the uh, model that we propose for the OLA. The OLA in French or in Spanish, uh, they're called the WAVE in English, and you know, it's like a stadium. You know, Bayern Real yesterday evening. Well, of course, we are far from Munich, so I'm, I might be in trouble there. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but Bayern Real yesterday evening, I'm sure I didn't see the game, but uh, I'm pretty sure that at some point people were did the OLA. And uh, it's quite amazing if you think about it. You have about 100,000 people sitting in a stadium. They are not being paid to do anything stupid, and from time to time they do that. Uh, so uh, I, this kind of emergence of something which is quite stable and uh, can, can go around for several, uh, several times, this is absolutely fascinating. You can go birds and so on, but I, I, I don't know anything about birds. So anyway, so um, is this summary? I would adapt because I have some vague idea of who is sitting in the audience, so if I see too many people falling asleep, I would just concentrate, uh, I will uh, uh, concentrate, I will condense a little bit the mass part to, uh, to go to the order. And I will do the order on the blackboard. Uh, I will start with a very simple example, uh, which is also a stupid example. A uh, very, very simple example where essentially no mathematics, no real mathematics are being needed. You just need to, to have some notion of minimizing a function. And uh, um, I will go very fast through functions of large numbers of variables uh, and will give you an example of what the models look like. I don't expect uh, uh, people that are not, not familiar with PDEs to really absorb the details of those examples, but just so we see how they look like. And I will, uh, I, I will mention an incredible list of open problems, issues, perspectives, it's a new subject and everything needs to be done. I will give you a, a, a few references. Okay, so that's the outline plus the order at the end. So, okay. So the, uh, the goal is it's being written. I just make sure that I'm going to say something which looks like what is written. It's indeed a new class of mathematical model that we, uh, uh, for the study of the average behavior of a very large number of rational agents in interaction. Okay, so many words, very large number, Mathematical idealization will go to a continuous limit, a continuum. So that's going to be the first idealization to replace a finite number of agents by a continuum of agents. Very large. Average behavior, that's going to be midfield. I am going to discuss that later on. And rational agents, that's rational in the sense that encompass, encompasses the, what the economists usually call rational. Uh, by rational, I really mean that if an agent has all, has all the information, he will choose his action according to a certain criterion. Now, in this criterion, you can have something that I would call mimicry, which is do like the others. So usually this is not called rational, it's an externality in economics, if you know economics, but uh, he, he, uh, in my sense, it's rational because there is a criteria. Do not deviate from the, uh, uh, from the general behavior. So, uh, uh, rational agents in interaction. Uh, and I want really to use some ideas that come from statistical physics and statistical mechanics, which are very classical, which are midfield theory, or self-consistent type models. Also, another, another way to think about our whole theory is to say that we are really creating Nash equilibria for continuity of small players. So there are all the notions that gave theory, I don't want to go there. Fine. So the main, uh, the main thing is that uh, it has a bunch of applications and it, it's, it is also completely new, mathematically speaking. The type of equations of questions that are being raised are completely new. So new mathematical problems, which, however, contain many, many classical problems like kinetic models, fluid mechanics, archetype equations, semilinear equations, also stochastic control, and that's natural. Why? Because if the agents lose their ability to choose their actions, they are just submitted to physical laws and become particles. So as a particular case, reducing the possibility of choosing, uh, you should have all the mean field models that exist in physics, and that's a bit, that's a, a, a lot of models. Of course, so why are we taking this continuous limit? This is only blah blah, so even if you're not following the blah blah, don't worry, it will end up soon. 
So, uh, so the, of course, you, 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 you want to play the game that physicists and, and, uh, have done for many, many years, which is that uh, going to the continuum limit, going to a macroscopic limit, you may expect simplifications. You know, if we take this room, which is full of molecules, and if we uh, expect to uh, uh, predict the temperature, the evolution of temperature in this room, uh, we are certainly not want to go to the, uh, all the electrons around all the atoms and so on. Uh, so large a number. But even if you think about uh, what uh, uh, quantum mechanics is or classical mechanics, you know well that when, uh, even when the final number is already pretty small, this is almost intractable. Okay, so uh, going to the continuum, you may expect some sort of simplification, which in physics is just the choice between being able to do something or not being able to do something. At least at a macroscopic scale, and I don't want to, to say too much uh, in those things, although you can immediately see some extensions from all the history of what I'm going to tell you, from all the history of physics, and so on. Um, okay. So uh, there is much more before I go, uh, go, uh, go into uh, this uh, simple example. Let me, uh, let, let, let me mention that uh, uh, there are uh, a, a, a bunch of other people than mathematicians have uh, jumped on, the, uh, on this game of midfield games, and uh, mainly some economists, in, uh, well-known economists like Bob Lucas in uh, Nobel Prize in Economics in, in Chicago and uh, other, other people. We have various collaborations with, uh, with people in economics. Other people have applied that to uh, traffic motion, traffic, but human traffic, you know, people just walking around. You know, the, uh, more and more when you uh, build a big room, you need to have some kind of simulation for safety reasons on how people are going to get out of the room in case of a fire, for instance. Uh, those, uh, those models are very, very rudimentary, and we can provide much more elaborate models that people can try to choose what they, what, what they want to do. Um, so the, the, uh, those applications, from a purely mathematical um, perspective, if you're really interested in a subject, you can download my courses at Collège de France. Now, of course, be warned, it's 48 hours of mathematics. So that's a long download, and it's in pieces, and, and you really need to be interested. But if you want just to glance a little bit, uh, you can always fast forward uh, your, your, through the videos and um, it's follow, uh, it can be followed. There are a few references but only for, for people that are interested that I can provide. There is no point in, in wasting time with references. Um, okay, so I, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna start with a very simple example which that search is in fact known. People in around game theory operation research know this type of very simple example, but it, it will show you some ideas of what we are trying to do. Now, if you want to have some kind of pragmatic example behind that, I will give you two in a minute, but here is the game. So we have uh, D players, and we have N players, sorry, N players, N is the number of players, and they just have their only, the rule of the game is picking up a location in a, in a, in a set which is, for instance, RD because I'm an analyst, and an arbitrary metric space, this is completely irrelevant. Um, or for this space, in fact. But anyway, so uh, each player, let's, let's call it I, uh, will choose a certain location uh, in order to minimize a certain criterion. And this criterion is a function fi, it depends on the player, right? But it depends on the locations of all players. Okay? So each guy would like to minimize this, but which depends on the other the other players, which are also trying to minimize their own uh, their own function. And of course, you cannot minimize simultaneously n functions of n variables. Okay. So that's where you need some other notion of equilibria, which is a substitute for a minimum, which may, would make no sense. And that's a notion that Nash, uh, the famous mathematician, uh, proposed and uh, developed in a note uh, which is about two or three pages long, which is uh, uh, beautiful, and uh, for which he got the Nobel Prize in economics. Uh, so here the notion, 
a Nash equilibria is a set of points chosen by all the players such that whenever you freeze all but the ice one at those locations then the xi bar is indeed the minimum of the reduced function where you have frozen all the other locations so precise magnification is there so for each i you want x bar i to be a minimum of the right criteria but observe that except for the ice slopes that of course I did, which is the dot in, uh, inside the fi all the xi have been frozen at the at x bar 1 at 2 x bar n but for the ice slopes fine so this is a notion of uh, Nash equilibrium it's a natural substitute for a, a notion of minimization of a minimum if you add a single variable uh, and so today it's, uh, it's also plagued with lots of undesirable properties lack of existence almost always lack of uniqueness lack of stability of so many of those uh, equilibria difficulties to compute and so on so this is very often a nightmare from a real application point of view I promise that I would have some practical examples so this uh, I'm going to give you two examples one which is about do we have a pen? Yeah. Very good. One which is about the uh, where are we going to spend our vacation next summer? This is a typical game that are being is being played in French families in, in periods that vary from January for the well organized to June for the less well organized. Uh, of course, you know that uh, vacations in France are typically July 15 to August 15. Uh, where uh, all activity except touristic activity essentially disappears in France and so strikes of course that's uh, the, uh, the, um, <clears throat> so we're going to spend our vacations uh, next uh, summer so usually that's uh, you know, the rate of divorces increases not with your mother anymore uh, but anyway so the, uh, the, uh, the uh, vacations is one example the other example that I like very much because it's uh, very close to uh, 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 something that was proposed by a great Dutch economist. So this is a C. I was born near the sea, so I need the sea. Uh, so this is a C. So this is the beach, right? You can think it's one dimensional, just to simplify. Okay. So where are we going to where are we going to put our towel when we go to the beach? Right? Very serious problem. Uh, of course, you know, if you are just a, a line and no points of interest, but uh, uh, you want to have a drink and to eat. So from place to place, you may have a spot of interest. So you don't want to be too far from it. And presumably, the density of towers in the neighborhood could affect your decision, both positively or negatively. Come back to that, depending on your age. Uh, <laughs> so, fine. So, okay. So we want to be nearby that, and our, where are we going to uh, put our, our tower? Fine. Those are the two examples. I'll come back to the, those examples to, to provide an explicit solution. Now, uh, I already mentioned that Nash equilibria are indeed a very natural notion, uh, playing with lots of difficulties. And now I want to say, well, if I were to consider a continuum of players, would it be any simpler? Now, of course, going to, uh, going to uh, letting n to go to infinity, you need some more mathematical structure. And uh, the main assumptions I'm going to make throughout the lecture, although we have extensions, it's always much easier to extend than to invent. And uh, the, uh, the, the, the main assumption is going to be that the players are indistinguishable. Identical is a bit too strong, especially if we are thinking about people who work with that. One doesn't like the idea of identical people, but indistinguishable meaning that they will have the same type of preferences. Okay? So it's an homogeneous crowd. Now you may have two crowds and, uh, this, uh, and you will have an extension of that, but this is the main uh, simplification. Now as soon as you make this assumption, you have a very specific structure of the criteria. Because seen from the I guy, seen from the I guy, all the others are the same. So you can interchange if you are number one, number two, and number three, you can interchange. This means 
that naturally you have a structure where f depends on xi, my choices, and, and the rest of the crown, well, this depends on the rest of the crown, but in a symmetric fashion. Fine. Now, the fact that also I am not different from the other is reflected by the guy that this function of xi and n minus 1, all the variables in a symmetric way, that this function doesn't depend on i. Okay, now the big claim, and that's section 2 in the talk, is that whenever you have a such a structure, when you have a function that depends on, in a symmetric fashion, fashion of a, a large number of variables, the right way to look at it without which uh, erase the dependence upon n is to say that it's a function on a probability distribution. What is a correspondence is that you replace points you replace that by the empirical distribution. Right? Empirical distribution. <coughs> Clearly, this is automatically the symmetric function of the xj. The sum is commutative. Symmetric. And you have no loss of generality because there is the same information contained in, in, in such a set of points, modular symmetries, which mean yeah, permutations, I should be more specific, uh, than uh, you have in that object. You have exactly the same content of information. But now, once you, once you realize that's the case, now you have something which is an arbitrary quality measure, and you can let it go to infinity. You have a mathematical setting which is n independent, doesn't depend on the number of people. Okay, so here is an example. So I'm sorry this is badly written, but uh, uh, I'll try to, uh, to, to explain. So, uh, a typical example would be that fi depends on xi, that's my preferences. You know, the family, French families, they want to go near the sea. That's a preference. So here, I would like to be nearby or not too far away from this point of interest. So it could be like f naught equal x squared, because you're willing to move a little bit, you're willing to walk a little bit, but it's very warm and uh, very hot, and you certainly don't want to uh, walk a long distance. Fine. Just to give an example. Let's see, I've thought about it. And then comes the other people. So here is an example. And here with a, uh, what, what I wrote down is really counting how many people are being in a neighborhood. Right? The empirical density around me. Right? So typically, you know, whether where I will put my tower or will I will, uh, will go for vacations may depend on how many people are going to be there. So, uh, uh, typically, this is uh, the scale, which is a finite scale, because I have a finite number of people. So this is an accident, let's say a few meters if you are near the beach. And I normalize this by the volume of the ball for technical reasons and by one over L, in order to have some, uh, something which uh, 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 makes more sense mathematically. It's just a normalization. Uh, in fact, uh, behind this one over L, however, there is the second assumption. Two assumptions, indistinguishable players, and second assumption, any given player has a very little influence on the outcome of the, uh, of the game. Hence the one of that. Oops. So, uh, so here I'm counting how many people are in a neighborhood and uh, possibly I have a certain function uh, in front of this number which is going to uh, uh, translate really how averse people are to a crowd or how much they desire to be in a large group. So typically uh, at that stage I usually say that the normal people tend to choose aversion, you want to avoid the large crowds. But there are also a category of abnormal people that tend to prefer to prefer large crowds, and they are called teenagers. <laughs> so uh, let's uh, let's keep the, this in mind: teenager against uh, old people like me. Like and uh, <clears throat> so now we're in a situation where we can let n go to infinity, and uh, I'm not providing any proof of that statement. Uh, but uh, here is a theorem, all last points converge as n go to infinity uh, uh, to a solution of this uh, following method game model. And 
this is uh, the midfield game model and I want now to comment it. So we forget all the players. What we have is the distribution of, of people. The priority distribution, the normalized distribution, that the end is not the member, it's normalized. So a normalized distribution of players, the probability of an RD, and uh, what is the, uh, 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 how does one compute this M? What is the, map, the MFT model in that case? Well, what you say is that you take a generic player. What is a generic player? It's any point in the support of the measure. Because outside the support, there are other players. So pick any X in the support of M, and you want X to be a minimum of the function of X freezing M, freezing all the others. Okay? So, and you, there is no such interaction because any given player counts for very little. So, you see now that you have some kind of uh, some fixed point problem. Huh? You want to find the M such that whenever you take the point in the support, it, it, it is in the set of minima of the function where you have frozen M. So, in other words, if you just want to write the line, if you are looking for a priority measure such that the support of M is in the set of the minima of that function of the dot, a given M. So, fine. So, this is uh, not an optimization problem. It's a little fixed point problem. You have to solve an optimization problem for each M, and you have to find a fixed point, or one fixed point. Fine. Okay, so uh, a few mathematical facts, so I can give you the answer to that. It's, uh, um, the first of all, the proof is elementary, but not that simple. I have to confess that uh, the first proof I could make was using from uh, Hamilton Jacobi PDE, and then I, I found another proof that was more direct. Um, you have very general existence here, and due to the compactness of the set of priority measures, and the combined assumptions, uh, stability of some equilibrium, mod and, uh, and, uh, and then the possibility of doing some kind of, sorry, numerical computations. Now, there are two things that I really want to uh, emphasize. One which is about uniqueness. In fact, there is a situation where you have uh, uniqueness, which is when this function f, uh, <coughs> this, uh, uh, the, this function f has a certain monotonicity property. So, uh, the definition of monotonicity is given there mathematically. Uh, I will concentrate on the example. Uh, and uh, before I get into the example, let me mention efficiency. The example is going to be uh, is going to follow. Is that whenever this uh, criterion, or average criterion, cap f, uh, comes from a potential, then you can solve those midfield games by minimizing uh, this potential. So a little bit like in physics, with between the force and the, the potential, except that there is no physics, there is no optimization of firing. Uh, in economics, this type of problems, uh, this type of uh, 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 interplay between a centralized problem and uh, uh, and uh, the uh, fact of you know having uh, players uh, choosing their doing their best is called centralization versus the, decentralizations versus coordinations. This is a very classical thing. So this happens sometimes. It's not general. It's uh, just in a very particular case. But uniqueness, this is a very important structure condition. And here I want to emphasize the example. So now we go back to the beach. Forget all the mass, uh, uh, the mass stuff. We have this f naught of x plus an f of m of x. Uh, you have uniqueness and efficiency if f is increasing, if uh, the crowd, if your crowd averse, you want to avoid large crowds. So that's natural because in some sense people will tend to occupy as, at best the, uh, uh, the location. But in general you have non-uniqueness if f is decreasing, if you really want to be with lots of other people. And that's natural because saying that there are two spots of equal interest. Now, instead of having one, think of a situation where two, you have two spots of interest. So people will tend to flock around one place or the other place. And clearly, you're going to have non-uniqueness. So this is uh, quite, and you need something more to decide. I mean, the theory will just give you all the possible locations where they will flock together. They will not tell you which one they will choose. And you know that you need something else in order to make them choose. And 
that's why cell phones are so important for teenagers. They have to agree to meet somewhere, right? And that's, uh, so you, you need something else. You have fashions and everything. This is not about it. You have an old place transition. Those, this, uh, uh, this might happen, but this uh, that's completely in the limbs in the future. I, I have no idea. The place transition is certainly a word that I want to mention right now because that should be, that would be a very, very natural complement to the theory. Um, but we are very far from that, or transition from one equilibrium to the other. In some cases, adding some time, we can, we can add some, some, some glimpse of that. But even more so, even more so in, let's say in the first case, when you have uh, 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 so an f of m, so typically the criteria is really x squared times m plus uh, uh, the, uh, the integral game is going to be just finding an, an M such that the support of M is included in the set of minima of uh, X squared plus uh, F of X of M. Now even if you take a, uh, an F of M, I'm sorry it's here, the example is just F measures your aversion if it's increasing and uh, here you're looking at the density of people. So if the density is large, f is larger and larger, and if you want to minimize that, bad news. So that's why you really are averse to a large crowd. But uh, so, you know, finding an m that solves such a problem is not easy. Think about it. How are you going to do it? Uh, other, but if you have this efficiency, and that's the case, then uh, the potential that you need to minimize is just the integral of x squared m plus a primitive of f of m. And now this becomes a standard problem for calculus of variation. And it turns out that at least in this example you can solve it explicitly. And here is the answer. The answer, the equilibrium, is going to be by f minus 1 of a certain uh, Lagrange multiplier minus m. Ah, I'm sorry, minus x squared. Okay? So lambda is uh, unknown parameter which is a Lagrange multiplier, and you just choose it in such a way that the total mass of m bar is 1. So that's really, really explicit. You see that if f is log, which is certainly an increasing function, what you have is a Gaussian. And you have a Gaussian distribution of powers. Uh, if f is uh, like uh, the square, what you have is a, a semi uh, you know, it's going to be a distribution with compact support like that. And it depends very much on what is your type of risk aversion. If it's a mild one or a strong one. If it's a mild one, you might spread. Uh, you, you might concentrate a little bit and so on. Okay. So explicit solution, because you have this uh, efficiency principle in general, this may be a hard problem to solve. Okay, so what did we learn? First of all, is uh, letting n go to infinity Suddenly, at least in some cases, we can even solve explicitly. So we see the simplification. We also get a taste of what Minfield games models should be uh, by uh, forgetting about all of the individual players and looking for density of players. So let's keep this in mind out of this simple example. Third uh, point that I want to make is that this theory doesn't tell you anything about where you want to put your power. And we are supposing you know how to do it. But if everybody behaves in a similar way, we can predict the distribution or the resulting distribution of powers. So you, you need to understand that. It's not a guide on how you should invest uh, with, uh, with the stock markets, right? Uh, <coughs> but if everybody be, uh, behaves in a similar way, then you may expect a certain type of things which from time to time are called bubbles or uh, bubbles bursting is also a very, very uh, uh, interesting situation where people behave all in a similar way. Anyway, so um, that's it for the simple example. Uh, I want to spend, because this may be of independent interest, there's almost nothing to do about minted games. Uh, it's uh, uh, just to give you, to spend a few minutes on uh, why is it the case that a function of a symmetric, uh, a, a symmetric function of a large number of variables 
is the same thing as a function of a polynomial space, which after all is not entirely clear. I just mentioned that you can replace positions by uh, by uh, uh, by an empirical density, but in fact uh, there is much more than that. It's uh, um, and uh, basically uh, here is a picture you should have in mind. So what is suppose that the points are living in the interval zero one. Okay. So if you have uh, one player, that's the interval zero one. If you have two players which are indistinguishable. This is like a square. A square and two points in, uh, uh, you know, that's a set of two points in zero one. one Now, symmetrical means that you're folding the square over the diagonal. You identify the two points which are symmetrical along, along the diagonal. Now, if you to go to three points, you have a cube and you fold it twice. So you get strange object. And you keep on folding as n increases. At the end, you have a very compact object and there's a set of quality dimensions. Now, this is really not a proof, uh, but this is really the real fact. In fact, you, it, it lifts everything from my head, including the differential structure. Uh, lots of people have been working on space of quality measures because of optimal transportation. You mentioned Cedric, who probably wrote about a thousand pages on that subject, Cedric Vialis, right? Uh, uh, about those subjects, but somehow they are, uh, they are not using the uh, natural lifting of the differential uh, structure uh, that, uh, that is in our head. So uh, the, the main point is that you have in fact an isomorphism, and I don't want to get into that, between the state space to the n, the set of n positions, quotiented by cat mutations, that's indistinguishability, indistinguishability so that's the quotient space, and uh, with a space of empirical measure of that sort, and in fact the, uh, the distance are the same, so it's really completely a, a, an embedding, and that's how it really you can lift everything to the, on the set of quality measures. Okay, so here is a general statement, which in some sense uh, I realized afterwards that various people in various contexts had had the intuition of this result, never formulated with such a simple statement. Uh, as head of Brimbaum for uh, the study of uh, Boltzmann hierarchies. And, uh, uh, and this is an amazing paper in theoretical physics, but it's seen because it's, uh, it makes absolutely no mathematical sense. But he's saying, well, in point, it's like a priority measure. So now I'm writing equations, pointing out equations uh, on, uh, in, in the set of priority measures. He has just the perfect intuition, uh, no mass, but absolutely perfect really uh, mentioned this paper in, in theoretical physics. Uh, but anyway, so um, so typical statement is that if you have a sequence of continuous functions which are symmetrical in x1, xn, plus some kind of uh, hiding some mathematical defects under the carpet, uh, some kind of uniform modulus, then automatically up to subsequences you can represent those functions by your functions on the set of space, on, on the space of measures. Now, this is a systematic fact which uh, uh, I think might be helpful in other contexts. We have used it in other contexts. For instance, I always dreamed that maybe people should, could think in terms of you know, numerical discretization in those terms. Because after all, greed is a set, is a symmetric set of points. A numerical computation is a function uh, which is a symmetric set of points. It doesn't depend on the way you label it. So which means that uh, there might be things where you capture all possible convergence even on bad grids uh, 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 through such a setting. We started looking a little bit into it with Bjorn and uh, neither Bjorn and Christ, but neither Bjorn nor I has the time to do it seriously. So if there are people interested, but more and more people are thinking of optimizing the grids and so on. So I, I, I think it makes sense to have this in mind. This is just a possible avenue that you should feel free to feel free to explore. Um, there is much more in that direction, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of the feeling which is of the mathematics which are needed to justify what I'm going to now present. So I'm going to jump over the whole section and just give you a tiny glimpse of what those models really, really look like in some continuous settings, because uh, since I'm a PD guy, 
earn my living by writing down and try to do some math on buildings. So, um, so right now what, I, what I'm going to do is that well, now time is going to be continuous, space is going to be continuous, the attributes of each player is going to be continuous, are going to be continuous. Because uh, when I say x lies in our n, don't be frightened by the equation. I'm not going to spend too much time with the equation. Uh, uh, but when, uh, when I say x that lies in our d or in our n, uh, the variable on which the unknown functions act, it's not only location. In the examples I mentioned before, it was location. Those are all the attributes that you want to model of a player. Well, its age, its position, and I mentioned a few uh, a, a few examples. More and more, more and more uh, people are observing regularities in social studies, uh, distributions of wealth in a uh, in a country. You uh, you find that the tail of those distribution in Germany or in France for about 40 years is always the same. It's a parallel law. Uh, distribution of the size of towns in a country. Take out the uh, the big uh, the big uh, the big towns, and uh, already you can define really what a city is, which is not that easy. Uh, from a, a geographical point of view, you find amazing irregularities. One small Pareto's law. Pareto's law is an inverse power law, and uh, the main point that the exponents stay the same. In Germany, it has stayed the same for about 40 years. In France, it has stayed the same for about 40 years. Uh, the states only. Uh, Uh, all those regularities, uh, uh, it's possible to explain those regularities with some of those models or to propose models to explain those regularities. But anyway, so, uh, and uh, you know, size of a city, that's an X. Uh, the wealth is an X, and so on and so on. Uh, the number of, uh, of tweets, you know, if you look at uh, Twitter and uh, you look at the distribution of retweets, which are the uh, 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 the, the main uh, people that uh, provide the most tweets. So you take out the first hundred, the first one, the, by, uh, by the way, is Lady Gaga, and number six is Obama. Right? Uh, we, we do that in my startup. This is, uh, this is how I know it. Uh, so when, uh, if you raise uh, the, the first, uh, the, the first, first hundred, uh, then you have a perfect Pareto's law, which is stable from day to day. And Twitter is something which has no confidence. You can absorb, and even the mass of data is very small, uh, but there you can absorb all the data and treat it every day. Anyway, Facebook is another matter. Um, okay, so back to PDEs. Totally continuous situation, attributes, uh, continuous variables, time is continuous. Um, <clears throat> so each player now is, is going to uh, do some kind of stochastic control problem, and when he reaches at each time, he has to take a decision, and of course, his decision modifies the dynamics of the uh, uh, overall density of players. So, two unknowns, there is the M guy, which is indeed the density of players, and uh, we solve the partial differential equation, which... Uh, oh, I'm going um, that And... Uh, we, we, we solve some kind of parabolic equation, and you can say that this is like a heat equation for those who are more used to mechanical models and so on, like a Fokker-Planck equation. So that's uh, an equation that goes forward in time. You know initially the density of players, and if you knew beforehand all the actions of all the players, you would have like to describe the propagation of the density of particles, and you would have. Uh, a forward-looking uh, uh, parabolic equation, like a neat equation, a polish linear equation, all those are in field theories. Uh, Fokker Black equations and so on and so on. Boltzmann equation, if you, if you have jumps and so on, and that, that, would be, that would be that part of the equation. Now, of course, the F depends on the U guy, because you have to decide. Okay? So how do you decide? Well, you decide according to the best possible source, uh, Scenario knowing M, so you assume that you know M, and then you have to choose for your best possible action. And this is stochastic control, this is called the Hamilton Jacobi Banner equation, dynamic programming. Uh, and now this is a forward 
nonlinear parabolic equation. And it has to be backward. One, the evolution of the density, it's like in physics, time is running in a positive fashion. Now, when you choose, you anticipate. You always anticipate when you choose, so that's why it's going backwards. Now, what I didn't write is the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the depths of the horizon that you're looking here. All times, all future times are the same weight. But of course, you may, uh, you may be in a situation where you say, well, what happens in 10 years from now is almost irrelevant to what happens tomorrow. Uh, this, there will be an extra term and it's, it's exactly the same mathematical theory. Now, if the origin of the problems become, goes shrinks back to zero, this means that this whole equation, backward equation, disappears and becomes some algebraic law, which is like a physical law, and you have fun. So when you're dealing with uh, agent-based models and so on, there are limits of those models. By taking the horizon, you just say that the anticipation is being reduced to zero. We have myopic agents that decide just according to what they see immediately. Okay. No anticipation. So you, you have a huge, uh, in fact, variation between those models. And I took a situation which is very natural in terms of sustainable development, where you want to say that tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow are the same way than today. You may even say it's now more important, but that's another matter. So the interpretation is that U is a value function, the optimal criterion of a generic agent, given all the rest of the players, that's Nash equilibria. So it's a Bellman equation which goes backward, non-linear parabolic equations. If you didn't have the M, that's why we invented this positive solution, to solve those equations, and from the later there is the M. And on the other hand, you have forward-looking, I mean forward with a, a natural a time evolution, a heat equation. And think about it, uh, you never have those, uh, you know, the juxtaposition and coupling of a problem which goes backward in time or forward in time. Usually it's either totally forward in time or totally backward in time. Here it's completely coupled. Completely coupled because you need the M to, uh, to find the U and you need the U to find the M. <coughs> So the, uh, the great news is that uh, there is work for lots of people, and the bad news is that all the mathematical tools break down. So uh, everything we knew, and I've spent quite a few years trying to understand both of those uh, separate equations, and when we wrote those models, I quite a piece of cake, and know perfectly uh, both equations, and uh, I realized that I knew nothing. Okay, so... Um, a few examples, so you can recognize some of your favorite equations at least for some of you. Uh, when you have no M dependence, this is purely stochastic control. When you have no U dependence, this is uh, purely for <coughs> for Sweden, Vassal, for Sman, etc. etc. Here's a, a, a simple example. I simplified, took a very particular Laplacian term. This is like a viscosity. Uh, this is uh, an Hamiltonian term. And uh, without entering the details, here is a set of equations. Now, uh, out of this set of equations, which is a very particular example, uh, what you have when u equals 0 and <coughs> h is a half of p squared, and you have here just a, some kind of internal law uh, function, like the one I, uh, I wrote for the, the towel, uh, those equations are the name, they are called compressible regular equations. So, this is a particular. Uh, when you take mu equals zero and these choices, you have optimal transport and so-called Wasserstein distances. When you look at stationary <coughs> problems, you will recognize also linearity equations with very, very particular choice or RT equations, RT-like equations in, in, in quantum physics. Uh, and of course, you may have lots of names with several populations and so on. Another avenue that we have not explored. As you know, and there are more and more uh, uh, research projects dealing with uh, mass biology or mathematical modeling in biology, in, par in particular, uh, you know, population dynamics or population genetics and so on. Uh, traditional models involve uh, reaction diffusion equations and treating all those populations uh, with uh, very simple empirical laws. I mean, uh, they diffuse uh, uh, and uh, they are eating the other of being eaten by the other population and so on. Now think about it. Here is a completely different way to think about it. 
those populations can decide where they want to go. Uh, and in fact, uh, one can see with lots of species that they move. When there is no more any food uh, at a given place, they move. Right? Uh, this is an avenue. It has to be done very, very carefully. Uh, because when you treat with applications, you have to do it with the respect that is needed for the applications. And uh, this is something we have no time to develop. It, uh, no one has started on this. Again, I see young faces. Feel free to invade those powers. Um, I think they are just ripe for uh, doing some, <coughs> some interesting stuff. Of course, part of the artwork would be to convince biologists that it's worth it. Uh, but uh, if you have enough energy and enthusiasm, um, in terms of mathematical results and perspective, and I'll finish with the OLA because that's going to be simpler. Um, okay, despite, uh, for those of you who have been exposed to the zoology of PDEs, you already saw in the bunch of examples that the PDEs I was mentioning had essentially nothing in common in terms of mathematical treatment. Uh, in fact, it turns out that because of mimetic games, one can see lots of common points between those various sets. And, uh, in fact, there are various existence results, strong, weak, uh, possibly non-existence, justification as n goes to infinity, and there are two uniqueness regimes. Now, I, I want to mention uh, also one thing which is interesting when you start dealing with people that are interested in social sciences, from economics to other social sciences. And I'm not saying that by the director of ISIS, is a sociologist. Uh, she's also something else that I was not supposed to say in the book, to say it in public, right? Uh, you really want to know? <laughs> and, uh, uh, but seriously, um, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of email activity later. Uh, <laughs> you do, I'm sorry about that. Uh, uniqueness, well, uh, no, what I was saying is that when you deal with those people, very often when we interact with people in mechanics and physics, when a model is ill-posed, we just dump this model, right? Well, to simplify. Uh, when you deal with people in social sciences, no. There can be extremely interesting situations where you have non-uniqueness. Because this may be in different equilibria. And uh, so, and then you realize that it's even worse. Because already proving that the problem is well-posed is out, out work in PDEs, in maths. Uh, but uh, understanding it so much that you can explain why there is non-uniqueness, what breaks down, or why, what are the type of phenomena associated with non-uniqueness, is also something that triggers lots of questions we are not used to face. And that's, I think, very impressive. As usual, we're interacting with new people with new questions. Um, so the uniqueness regimes, and there are two general uniqueness regimes, either the horizon of the problem is not large enough, and the non-uniqueness doesn't have time to develop. Uh, it's not pushing your shits because it goes forward and backwards, so there is no notion of time and a small time. Uh, it's more complicated, but still, there is this notion of uh, if the horizon is small, or if the horizon of the, or if the future counts very little, which is exactly the same, um, and uh, you have uniqueness. You also have uniqueness under general monotonicity assumptions and it's very striking that what I mentioned, I even produced the explicit solution here, is in fact a general feature that also applies to the various cases I mentioned, uh, like Arte equation or semi-analytic equation, but also to the uh, compressible linear equation, because that's where you're going to recover that the, uh, the, the pressure is an increasing function of the density, which is sort of low thermodynamics. It's striking to see the, main, the, main, the same structure condition popping up in the general analysis. So uh, stationary problems, uh, <laughs> when the state space is finite, you have all these uh, extension to several populations, have a total structure, numerical analysis, numerical computations. There are about two or three groups in the world, but no more that are starting to do numerical computations. Uh, randomly heterogeneous populations, applications, correlation, partial mixation, regressive ability, the structure of noise, the fact that in general, you have an infinite dimensional problem. It's very huge, you to answer the 48 plus hours of, uh, of, of, of material that you can download if you really want more details. 
enough, you can see uh, you're, it's like opening a door, uh, you're creating a new class of models with applications, and then you have a huge, uh, a huge amount of questions, and there's a lot to be done. So uh, feel free to, to, uh, to invade this, uh, this, uh, this field. So now, uh, to conclude, let's go back to the order. Okay, so now let's concentrate on serious things, namely sports. Uh, I have to uh, warn you that I'm a rugby player, so I, I will not push it on, on football. Uh, there are some serious sports and less serious. So, uh, <laughs> so seriously, uh, so here is, uh, so you will see how one can approach uh, a, a stupid example like that with a, with a lot. Okay, so first of all, we're going to say first idealization in the stadium is a circuit, just to make computation easy. So, and then we are gonna, we're going to say that the, uh, so X is going to be on the circle, let's say 0, 1, if you normalize the length of the stadium, uh, uh, with uh, periodic conditions, 0 and 1 on the same. Fine. I'm going to identify the whole column. And I'm going to say that on the column, where roughly you have about 100 people in a typical stadium, this is where I'm going to have my density <coughs> of players. <coughs> so X is a label, because you don't move from one column to the other. You stay in the same seat. And Z is your position. So Z is between 0 and 1. So 0 means you're sitting, 1 means you're standing, 0 between 0 and 1 means you're like that. Okay? So, and uh, now, what are the model assumptions? <coughs> Let you see how uh, this works. Uh, the model assumption is that you have a, uh, you have a cost for moving, typical, uh, typically kinetic energy. Okay? That's it. It's an effort. Then you also have, that's one, then you have also have a, a, a cost associated to the position. So typically, a shape like that. Standing or sitting is comfortable. In between is quite uncomfortable. And if you want to minimize, you wouldn't want to stay like that forever. And the third, uh, third thing is to say, I want to be like the other. So I'm not going to write it like the others. Which means that I'm going to take some kind of average of the positions nearby and I'm going to have a cost which involves the uh, difference between my position and the average, uh, the average position in the label. So uh, typically what you have are two parameters which is if you say this is a half you have one parameter here, one parameter there, right, the strengths of those various costs, and uh, possibly a third parameter, which is the, uh, the scale of your neighbor. Now, you, once you have defined this cost structure for all agents, you can write down immediately your uh, set of equations, and uh, you can do the analysis of this, you can do the numerical analysis, and you see some periodic waves. But if you even want to do something, and that's uh, MFG, which uh, uh, for physicists would be like a kinetic model or a mesoscopic model. But you may also have the deduce from, uh, 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 from this uh, MFG model an even simpler model, which is a macroscopic model, where you're going to say that uh, fluctuations disappear. No fluctuations. And what that means is mean that in the end, when you have a small parameter, which, uh, 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 in, uh, uh, which means that m of x and z is going to be like a Dirac mass at a certain uh, position, z of x, which means that there is an average position for <coughs> the whole column. But that's a microscopic limit. Right? Then you pick up uh, a single equation that you can solve explicitly. Uh, and uh, either on the uh, MFG or even on the macroscopic model, you can prove the following here eh? that if the strength, if the coefficient in front of mimicry is strong enough, there is a cutoff 
exponent, there is a single stable periodic wave in a given state. Okay. So, which uh, means uh, in particular that uh, uh, it will have always in a given state a little same speed. Uh, so, that's the pretension of the model. Right? Uh, then you realize that there is a whole literature on holders. There is a whole scientific literature on the holders. Doesn't prove much. There is a whole scientific literature on any given subject nowadays. Uh, but there is a whole uh, scientific literature on OLA that started, uh, that started uh, I forgot this. The first OLA you, you remember was during the World Cup in Mexico. It was the first time people saw it. And um, it, it's certainly no surprise that indeed our, uh, at the beginning there were studies in, uh, in, in Mexico on, the, on this subject. Uh, but there have been lots of measurements worldwide uh, in the last Olympic Games in, in Sydney. They made lots of measurements. There have been experiments in the Netherlands because some physicists said, well, those are solitons. So they had the ideas of sending one Ola against the other <laughs> <laughs> just to see if they would cross without seeing each other, right? Of course, it was a disaster, but you can imagine the people in the middle, middle they see two Ola's going, well, <laughs> Uh, so that's because this is not a particle of fluid, fluid of people, right? Um, so this is a model. Of course, you can dispute this type of model, but if you dispute it, at least you know where the assumptions are. Right? Uh, this is clear. Now you may say uh, they are not rational; it's only a physiology. Uh, but let me tell you that the measurements worldwide always give the same speed with an increase. Uh, incredible accuracy. It's absolutely incredible. So you might say it's just the you know, depth of your vision, time of your action of your body and so on. Maybe, I uh, think this is plausible, I also <coughs> think that a little bit of this is also present, but uh, I, may, uh, I might be wrong. I wanted to conclude with this simple example just to show you how you use those models. You write down the modeling assumptions and uh, and, uh, and, your, uh, and you can write down, and then immediately, you know, it's like a toolbox, you have your model, possibly some numerical tools, and uh, no, I, I won't describe what we are doing at the start, but that's, uh, that, that's, that's enough. I think you have been brave enough to survive uh, through a mathematician talk for an hour, and you deserve a break, and you deserve to be allowed to escape from that room. And thank you very much for your patience. My uh, view, uh, uh, I, uh, I once want, want saw uh, uh, birds sitting on the, you know, sitting on the wire, and when you have lots of birds, it's absolutely amazing to see the regularity at which they set themselves. And I thought, okay, well, what do they want? What are they doing here? And uh, here, what I understood, 
they want to uh, uh, they want to be together. Right? They need a little bit of space, a little bit of space. And but what about the regularity? Well, it's, uh, I, 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 I would say that comfort, uh, especially if one gets out and so on, it's related to elasticity and a little balance, and it's not, it's going to be much more comfortable uh, if you have uh, equal uh, equal space. Uh, so now flocking, flocking here is my suggestion. Uh, you, what you observe are two shapes, the V shape and the single one. Okay? Uh, they want to be together. That's many things. Uh, they need a little bit of space. Now, uh, what about those shapes? I think it's about energy consumption. The profile. And then, of course, you rotate the one in front. Penguins also do those circles, and the one of the outer circles inside because they are being exposed to the cold. So uh, uh, I, would, uh, I would propose people would have to check and make the measurements, try to model and so on. But this, uh, this is like a research project. I, I don't have time to do it. And no one has, uh, has tried it. So if you think of energy and then uh, you, uh, it's like the shape of a plane or something, but the most aerodynamic one is it in the line, uh, like biking. Huh? And uh, the uh, <coughs> It's indeed the line, and you can think of it at the energy level, it's like a solid shape. It's a measure, so it's a portable measure. So, um, so the aerodynamics makes sense, you can make a computation, you can try to see. So, shape, if the uh, energy is not too much, like a V makes sense if energy is not too much an issue, of a very long distance, you prefer the line. And that's consistent with, uh, with the observation. Now, I'm not saying that birds are indeed, uh, uh, but uh, nature is very good at optimizing uh, you know, the ego and so on and so on. So, um, who knows? So, this is my, uh, my uh, really profound, stupid conjecture. Uh, but to do it seriously about this flocking and uh, issues, uh, some people should do it seriously. And it's a new subject, and people, it's heavy to, to, to get into a new subject. But young people should do it. Okay, any more questions? Yeah, it's, uh, I have a question which is perhaps a little bit more technical. You, you described the, um, the and I don't, I'm not expert on this at all, and you described this process of this meter games where you have a forward process and a backward process, and they are completely coupled. Now, the naive idea would be to do an iteration where you first do forward, then backward, then again, and you would like to see it con if it converges. And Not always. What would make, so the question would be, what kind of estimate would you use, and where would be the obstruction that you could use? Well, the, the difficulty is that most of the time this process doesn't converge. So don't, 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 don't even try to progress it. Uh, and even in cases when you have unique. In fact, even in some cases where you, uh, uh, you, uh, uh, you have convergence, you have to modify these simple iterations. So the way you freeze parts, the M has to be split in two parts, and, uh, and so uh, this is the only case where we understand what's happening. So in general, this type of iteration, and first of all, you have to define which iteration, and uh, you test it, and you realize that uh, essentially all of those that we have uh, tried won't work in full generality and it's very miserable and very often. So this is not a very good scheme, even with uh, lots of relaxation and so on. Any more questions? Yes. Um, in computer vision, there's this field which is called Markov random field. Yeah. And your last example was striking with similar. Maybe it's because my knowledge of uh, the use of random fields in, in computer vision is limited. I mean, I, I used to follow a little bit this subject, but that's a long time ago, so I may have uh, missed uh, some more recent developments. And immediately I don't see the analogy, but you may be, you may, you may be right. So my answer is I don't. 